Hi everybody and welcome to Matrix Live from Season 3 episode, God knows what. Something. Yeah, <laughs> where we're celebrating um, the release of Matrix 1.0 from the Alan Turing Institute. We pull the brightness like that so it sort of works. Um, where we're here joined by our very special guest, um, an Enigma machine. Um, there we go. Um, can you see it? Yeah, yeah there we go. There's an Enigma machine uh, which sits in the um, foyer here. Um, the Turing Institute is the... Um, uh, how would you describe it? It's kind of a cross-university computer science department for England, and um, we're here actually to talk to Professor Crowcroft. Who, as you've all um, seen in the announcement, is one of our new guardians for the Matrix.org Foundation. So we're actually just waiting for him to appear from whichever um, <laughs> office he lives in around here, um, but thought it'd be fun to say hi to the um, little um, Enigma machine, which obviously isn't compatible with Matrix, sadly. And um, I guess we'll join with John in a second. Speak soon. Well, hi everybody. We are here with Professor Crowcroft. Hey there. Um, thank you very Hello. much for joining us. Thank uh, you. My pleasure. Um, so uh, we're here in the Alan Turing Institute in London. What, what is the Turing Institute? Where are we? We are uh, inside the British Library. We have three floors of the building and we are the National Institute for AI and Data Science. Uh, so we do lots of machine learning. There's 13 universities and a whole bunch of strategic partners ranging from the NHS to Lloyd's Register, and we do data-centric engineering of the built environment. Oh, nice. So it's all interesting. We've got about 50 PhDs and 50 postdocs, and then from the 13 universities, there are loads of people like myself who in Cambridge who come visit here, spend some, some fraction of our time here, so we can talk to the students and stuff and have events and meetings and so on. And uh, we do lots of outreach stuff, and uh, uh, we're happy to have people visit and talk about any, any of the above. Cool. Well, um, I guess um, what we wanted to do was to, um, first of all, um, welcome to Matrix Live again, everybody, and um, have a chat uh, with John about um, the Matrix Foundation, and also I guess we should talk about Matrix 1.0. We did it, eventually. Five years, that's yeah. all it took. <laughs> Almost five years to the day, plus minus a week or so, um, to finally exit beta. Um, it's been a bit of a fun week um, with that, so apologies if we're a bit dead. Um, but um, yeah, we got it out the door, and one of the big exciting, and let's not talk about the tech of the foundation uh, of 1.0. I mean, everybody's done it to death. It's out there, it works, it's about stability, um, no new features for now, but lots of new stuff on the horizon. Go read Matrix Live if you want to hear about that. But the foundation is the more fun thing. Now the foundation work we started what? Uh, Back in October we started. Uh, no, that's when we, we found, it, yeah we incorporated it in, in October. October. We started the process literally a year ago possibly to the day in June of last year and it's been this kind of ongoing thing to get the governance structure right, get the articles right and then in October we actually set it up and we started talking to potential guardians um, who could come on board as basically be the non-executive directors of the foundation um, to keep us on um, myself and Amandine and indeed each other as uh, all five of us because it's Professor Crowcroft, it's um, Russ um, Schoolman, it is Schoolman, right? I would pronounce Schulman, but we should ask him. I'm pretty sure it's um, <laughs> Schoolman. Um, sorry Russ if we got it wrong. And um, Jutta Steiner um, from Parity um, who are the five um, um, directors and honestly we don't know each other that well um, obviously my, Amandine and myself have been working together for a ridiculous amount of time now but um, I know um, John should I call you John or Professor Crowcroft? John is fine okay um, so I know John from when he actually supervised me at the university briefly a long long time ago um, when I was writing an instant messaging platform as a part 1b um, project which is a second year project in human terms and um, it was incredibly ahead of its time we were using this brand new programming language called Java and how it worked was to go and like serialize messages um, in Java um, and point, put them down the pipe to a server and it would come out the other end so the gimmick was basically it just used pure Java serialization for everything and we were very smug about this we went and um, took it to our supervisor at the end to say hey what do you think of this amazing thing to which he said well why isn't it decentralized <laughs> do you remember this at all I don't know you do it was like 20 odd years ago <laughs> but it was yeah why isn't this peer to peer to which we basically said well shit frankly why why did we think of doing that sooner and is it too late to go and completely change the thing to be peer-to-peer -peer? and the answer was definitely yes so um, I guess Matrix in some ways could be seen as a um, pushback against that all those years ago um, so why, why did you think it should have been peer-to-peer -peer or decentralized so when you look at a lot of communication platforms on the internet uh, many of them uh, 
started out peer-to-peer -peer in some senses. So email, people forget because you probably use Hotmail or Gmail. But you can run your own SMTP server uh, on your own laptop and communicate with all the others in the world. Um, and that's actually a strength because the system's more resilient that way. Uh, and then uh, we were just talking about this, but Skype in its in, in initial instantiation uh, was, was uh, effectively a peer-to-peer -peer system um, and worked extremely well um, and was, was very resilient, uh, surprisingly so. And people, when they started, uh, were really terrible broadband things and, and Wi-Fi was not great and so on and they've managed to survive all of that pretty well and it was self-configuring how I figured out where the bandwidth was and so on. So and there are quite a few systems like the BitTorrent has been around for a long time too. This is a really good software distribution platform. In fact, there are people who use it for uh, video content distribution because it works well. So these things are uh, have a lot of uh, robustness about them and in, in many ways, uh, including if you're um, worried about people intercepting your communications uh, amongst other things but but also just resilient against stuff breaking out there mm. yeah no it's a real shame what happened to skype it was um using the nutella um, dht and code base i think called kazar or no kazar was built on nutella and then skype was done by the yeah. guys who did both of them and then obviously microsoft went and ripped out all of the fun bits and i i, I was talking to somebody about that and, and they, they 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 corrected me and said it was started with ebay Oh, and, right. the, and the reason was not completely stupid is they needed a centralized version of a shrink wrap that they could put into enterprise networks so mm -hmm. you could run your effectively your internal private voice over IP style internal telephone system so you want a version that does that because you want to manage it uh, and, and why they couldn't just fork and have the, the public version still be decentralized I don't know but then then it got rebought by uh, Microsoft because eBay couldn't make that business work for them it didn't fit that well yeah it's you always could, a bit of a weird one yeah well I, I think if you want a sort of private voice network where people are auctioning they could do bids I sort of saw the original mm -hmm. idea and then it didn't kind of make sense to you know they could have just used it they didn't need to own it uh, the Microsoft it kind of makes sense but then it really somehow they also made a terrible error of, I, I believe, replacing the codecs with their own and the audio codec in Skype was a thing of beauty, mm -hmm. incredible. And that's that's another beautiful piece of Scandinavian tech, if you like, that you know, somebody really knew what they were doing and that's gone forever now. And so oh, well, you say that because it was Silk, right? Yeah. The, um, yeah. the original one that was um, done by the guys who then formed Gips. Um, there was some overlap between Skype and Gips, which then became Web RTC. But I think what happened, oh, it was Kern Voss oh, was yeah, yeah. the um, codec design. Oh, God, how did it work? There were two of them. There was Isaac. Oh, yeah, sorry, this was it. Isaac from WebRTC, Silk from Skype. I think Kern Voss did Silk with Skype, and then they merged them together into Opus. Okay. And so on Opus, on the high, um, high, band, uh, high frequency stuff, it uses. Uh, let me get it right, Silk, and on the low frequency stuff, the voice it uses, ISAC, and it's literally, it's not totally dead. Um, and it, they also unencumbered it and open sourced it oh, right. into, and got it through the IETF as the RFC for um, um, Opus back in the day. Not that we ever used to build VoIP stacks before Matrix, <laughs> so we had a lot of fun. Uh, because we started off with Silk, and it was amazingly good, and then we were petrified after the acquisition it was going to die. Luckily, they kept it around for a while, and then Opus came around, and you got best of both worlds. So. Um, yeah, it was actually the original uh, promise of doing voice on the internet was that you could do better than telephony quality, mm -hmm. and you could you know head up to music quality, uh, and, and you know that so that was that was kind of the first time that that, you know, that was actually delivered on. I think, and it, it's really nice if you're doing you know, any you know back in the day. You, I'm, I'm talking like 1988. People did multi-party voice conferences on the internet, but when people spoke at the same time, you could, you just got horrible quality. Mm -hmm. uh, people were using any PCM and ridiculous right. things. I mean, which is just because all you all you had all the CPU performances that we could cope with uh, without a lot of clever work. Um, and then everyone knew this was the direction of travel, though, so, or the right direction of travel. So. Yeah. So how did you um, get into decentralization in the first place? Because I remember, um, in fact, when, when I was stalking you, to use the technical term, and uh, thinking about um, uh, who might be interested in getting involved in the Matrix Foundation as a guardian, um, and was looking through at your PhD thesis, and it was the same time that we were doing low bandwidth stuff with Matrix um, in like October or so, and it was 
freaky, frankly, because the kind of things which we were looking at with low bandwidth, um, um, sort of mesh-based communication for Matrix, looks suspiciously similar to the stuff that you've been doing uh, a little bit earlier. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is that this is, I mean, I worked on a, the, one of the first non-US internet sites and wrote two IP router implementations back in, in 1980, 81, 82. And that's a decentralized system. So at the packet level, the internet is decentralized. Uh, uh, so uh, most of the support technology address allocation schemes so eventually became naming the system became decentralized, somewhat decentralized. Uh, and then every now and then somebody would centralize one piece of it. And I, I, one example I, I looked recently was uh, certificates. And whenever they do that, something goes wrong. Uh, and so actually uh, Ben Laurie at Google came up with a CA transparency system, which is to try and go back and fix that. And uh, and then um, uh, and then the, when I got really uh, a beer in my bonnet about really decentralizing was with cellular networks as they added cellular data and you know, started to get smartphones. So now we're up to kind of you know, 1999. Um, the, um, the phones were shipping running Windows operating systems, one of the first operating systems out there, but also uh, Docomo NTT in Japan shipped a Linux phone, oh, yeah. and uh, you would you would you'd have uh, you might have Wi-Fi on it, you might have Bluetooth on it, and you'd have the cellular data link, but you couldn't forward packets. And I'm like, why is that? You had to you actually had to turn off a piece of the operating system to stop you turning your phone into just a mobile router that could let everyone else around go through that device over the long link. And so we we did a lot of work. Uh, we in a group in Cambridge uh, decided that this should not be a thing, you should be able to do this. Um, and also, uh, we kind of went further. So, we'd heard of a, a really crazy idea, which is uh, the late on networking, which is the idea of not only do you deal with um, decentralization uh, in space, but you deal with it in time. And so, you time shift communication. Um, so, the idea would be uh, you encounter some people and they want to get some information from some other people. You can't reach them yet but they know you will see them later and so they hand you information and just send you a packet and then you don't send it to the next stop until you're near the next stop. Mm -hmm. It turns out this is fantastic because uh, obviously you, you do free communication, it copes when things are really bad, when there are disasters and the infrastructure breaks, you know, there's floods and there's no power for the cell towers, your phones can still build a network that can usefully communicate so that's useful and um, it's it's got lots of resilience in fact there was a guy who took our work and shipped a thing called FireChat, which was used mm -hmm. by people in Hong Kong in demos, so they can't be wiretapped, which is very cool. Um, and that, uh, there are new versions of that now, but that, that was a while back. Well, I don't so know if uh, we've meant, well, you have to yeah. tell the punchline yeah. on this one, haven't you? Yeah. Well, the new version of Warriors, uh, FireChat is actually using Matrix. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's, yeah, I'm a little bit surprised, honestly, because it was this beautifully peer to peer thing, and yeah. that's basically Matrix is many things, but it is not yet beautifully peer to peer. And the, the, the later on thing gives you all kinds of other nice properties, and one of the other things we, uh, were against in the centralized world was that the uh, telephone companies that bought Spectrum uh, treat the Spectrum as a, as a scarce resource which they then effectively price, uh, you know, effectively they use scarcity as a, a model for pricing. And when you do this delay tolerant communication, the Spectrum is not a scarce resource. There are other techniques for doing that, like massive MIMO, for example, uh, which MIT's done a bunch of cool work on, uh, many, many people now, uh, where you just share all the different paths mm -hmm. in space, but you can also do this in time. And then effectively, local communication can happen in parallel everywhere, and then the next of the local configuration have in parallel without interference and system scales. So then the spectrum stops being scarce resource, which is super interesting because mm -hmm. then the price of communication doesn't, you know, it becomes effectively heading for free, uh, which is where it should be. Um, so this is, you know, getting rid of artificial scarcities that are imposed by centrality. God, I wish we could properly get going on the peer-to-peer -peer and the mesh-based stuff, especially the kind of store and forward stuff. I mean, we were looking at it a bit on the low bandwidth stuff um, back in October. Um, I don't think we open sourced any of it yet, unfortunately. But um, the, what we were looking at was um, what they call thickets, uh, overlapping DAGs, um, so that you'd have a binary tree um, that would use some kind of spanning tree um, mechanism across the mesh, but then you would do a few other ones in order to try to get some level of resilience, so that even if you did have a bad node in the spanning tree, um, you could potentially uh, well, use one of the other ones, and so you'd right. have enough redundancy, redundant paths going through the system. I guess it, it doesn't have the MIMO sort of global optimization 
of the scarcity problem because I guess there the idea is that you know at any given point the optimal path through the whole thing. Or? Uh, well, you can you do not have to know it. You can do it by coding tricks. So um, uh, yeah, what you're talking about sounds like gradient routing, which is another technique for for, the, for, for, for choosing kind of tangled pathways. <laughs> Um, but the way the, the best, best way to do it is try and be agnostic about the optimization problem. So it's actually the, the other inspiration in fact comes from swarms and BitTorrent. So BitTorrent actually is continually altering the set of nodes that deliver the blocks and the files. Uh, and it is a, it's a very nice math result from stats in in Cambridge and a, a guys at Microsoft uh, Pitch Key uh, that showed that is the optimal bandwidth allocation, but it's all done by local decisions, which is really nice. So you can do the same trick. With, Essentially, what you're doing is you you're locally choosing the power level to communicate with people at the next stop, um, and that reduces your interference with people at the second third stop. And it's um, uh, anyway, there are many many combined tricks, and they're all they're all quite cool because lots of local optimization lead to a global optimization, which is way better than a central plan system. So, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, no political implications yet at all. <laughs> None whatsoever. Not like there are any protests happening in Hong Kong as we speak. They might be benefiting from um, uh, a decentralized communication peer to peer system. I guess it was fire chat last time around. I'm not sure what they're using that. I don't know. Telegram went to them. Do you see the Telegram? Uh, yeah, thing? Telegram um, did, yeah. Uh, they, they claimed they were being DDoSed yeah. Um, yeah, related to yeah. it, whether that's true or not. Um, who knows? Let me just go and shut the door. Um, yeah, it's not staying. <laughs> Where's so, um, it so What's the. We're good for it. Yeah. So what are you? What does it mean today for you? What kind of uh, specific decentralization project are you participating in, pushing forward? Ah, uh, yeah. So um, one of the things we're doing uh, with uh, so guys, I'm seeing in the pub in about half an hour. Um, you're welcome to come along. Um, uh, Hamid Hadadi from Imperial um, uh, and colleagues in Cambridge are building an, an edge cloud system. And this is not there. Edge cloud means lots of different things to different people. One of the things it means is if you're a telco or a cellular provider, it means you put a, a rack just at the, at the cell tower or just inside the broadband link, so at the VSLAM or the cable header. And that, that's fine because that can deliver service more efficiently than it being miles away in a big data center. What we mean by edge cloud is this in, in, in the cloud is in your pocket, in the, in the home, on the center box or whatever, and the smart meter, and it offers. We we put a, a system that effectively is like containers, but with a, a lower level that does isolation, which just uses the arm processor and stuff, um, and a, a software platform that lets you do machine learning over the data at the edge. Um, so you decide who, who can send you code to run machine learning on your data. Uh, so you might take all your friends and family and say, we're going to build a private face recognition system for all of us and everybody else. You might import models from public face recognition systems, but you don't send your data to them. Uh, and then you improve your model and all your friends and family model, uh, and then you have a little nice face recognition system, you know, which will point to your friend and label them in the pictures you take as they be part of this agreement. So that's just an example. There are a lot of other applications which could be monitoring well-being and health or whatever, where again, you don't necessarily want to give anyone other than perhaps your doctor or paramedic the data. Um, uh, but maybe though, you want to allow privacy preserving algorithm processing of your health data to go to the national health service. That would be a, a reasonable thing, it might be. So, so, so that kind of, you know, role-based access control and, 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 and also what you're training, where stuff goes seems to be a part of that picture. And what's the project called? That's uh, that the, the starting project. That's called DataBox. Okay. Uh, and it's uh, it's a bunch of it's quite a, quite a quite a big deal actually. People starting to think about using it. In fact, we talked to Tim Berners Lee, like we Hamid did, um, about this. They trying to influence his new solid model, yeah. and, and, and I, I think he's taken in some things from there. That'd um, be cool. Um, um, and there's a second project which we have, which is a startup, uh, which has a similar governance model to <laughs> the Matrix governance model, actually. It's, it's, and it's not a coincidence. <laughs> so they did actually look at it. Um, oh, really? Um, yeah. It and, um, well, it clearly works perfectly. So. Uh, well, it, and, and, and HAP was originally going to use Databox as its platform, but the Databox is a research project which kept changing. So the HAP folks, so like for Andreas, uh, and actually just said, I'm going to build something. So we built that platform mm -hmm. for that. And that is a sort of personal cloud platform. 
again, which um, you can coordinate things across a collection of these hats, like data boxes. Oh, okay. yeah. And are you, are you doing some re decentralized work too, I think? Well, the re decentralized, yeah. So um, the really crazy thing we've got is um, it, some guys, uh, there's a, there's a um, uh, you've probably heard of Toby Q. Uh, okay, this is a non blockchain e payment system. Cryptocurrency kind of thing. What's They're pretty big. Toda Q. T O D A Q. I should look them up. Yes. So they <laughs> they want to uh, uh, give a unrestricted gift to the Cambridge to start a centre for re-decentralisation. Okay. And um, so the set of things we're talking about are you know, that would just be a research centre, which, which is combining what we're already doing. Um, and one of the things we've been doing, that, which I think is is kind of interesting. Um, is we work with a, a community mesh network in Spain called Guifi. Mm -hmm. And this is a big community mesh network. One of the things nobody's quite sure why it's so big and it's lasting. It's kind of somehow sustainable. And we <laughs> Probably best not to ask. No, well, we actually have anthropologists studying it because we, we'd like to know. And the people who, run, who kind of run it, they don't, it's self-run, but they're trying to see if they can seed the same kind of network in other places. Mm -hmm. It seems to be. But one of the things we've deployed on there what is one of the people who's kind of re stuff is a it's a smart contract system okay. which is kind of why this is where this this total stuff comes in because what they want to do in the Guifi network is to do crowdfunding of projects and it's a community so a community in some village might want to get money for a new playground or they might want to you know have a, a, a big party yeah. they want to raise money for it so what we have is a, a, a kind of full-on ethereum system running actually decentralized not on some uh, uh, cloud servers. So it's running on briefy nodes. And on top of that, we have a thing that will take human readable contract things for crowdfunding. So it sort of bids to say, yeah, I'll give you, you know, whatever, 10 euros towards that thing. And if you reach your target, the distributed computation will go, oh, we reach the target, commit the money. And, and that's actually every single level of it is decentralized. We can even go as far as say some of the nodes are solar powered. So they don't even depend on electricity grid. Awesome. So, so, you know, so that's kind of really kind of fulfilling the whole promise because it's, uh, if, if, if you can build a thing like that. Yeah. And the experiment at the moment is seeing if the community, the so society, the people, are okay with the contract system on that if they like that because I and mean, you could change the contract obviously so that and they can see what you know or they can write their own and so on. Imagine the tax so, implications could be quite beneficial potentially uh, in terms of transferring stuff around by smart contract. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting. That's an interesting. That's usual. You know, the dark and light side of these systems. Um, I think at the moment everything that's being done is is uh, you know it's sort of for social good. So you can claim this is a, a community mm -hmm. trust charity type activity. But yeah, I mean. Get someone to start laundering or whatever, uh, which would be problematic. <laughs> Sorry for going for the really boring question. No, no, but I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's a thing you have to think about. You know, somebody, if the thing gets more successful, well, if it is properly will, taking off, you can yeah. definitely see people might get a bit upset about it for the worst possible reason. I mean, fighting decentralized. In fact, did you come across um, the thing that the GNUnet guys were doing? Um, uh, Taylor, hang on, hang on, hang on. Are we talking about the same project, Taylor? New Taylor? No. Okay, okay. Well, so th that's another cryptocurrency. Okay. Yeah, it's not a smart contract thing. But it's one that um, a guy called Christian Grotoff, um, who's at INRIA, um, did GNUNAT, um, was working on for a while. And I think it's still going on. But the fun thing there is that it's designed to be um, tax um, friendly, bizarrely. Oh, so yeah, yeah, it's yeah, entirely yeah. anonymous, sure. um, no metadata going through the system at all. But you had a zero knowledge proof that the tax was going to the right person. So yeah. they were trying to sell it to governments. There's, um, there's one that was done a couple of years back by UCL folks at the Bank of England called RS Coin, which actually included a capability to choose whether a blockchain was anonymous or, or um, uh, explicitly named and to choose whether to carry tax or not. Mm -hmm. And at one point at the beginning of the chain said, we're going to declare who we are, everyone else had to, it didn't have to take part of course. And then at one point said, we're going to need to pass VAT through, you just you just, you just pass the VAT through. And that, that was, you know, so I think it's, the ideas come up in multiple places. The other thing, I was at an event, amazing event in the Royal Society with uh, a room full of half computer scientists, half judges. I mean, really senior legal thing, and this was about blockchain and the law, okay. and and the, the the legal opinion appeared to be that um, the way we get around the um, dark web stuff is that the exchanges where you can actually detect who people are 
or, or, or the exchanges that do that service will just be bought inside the perimeter of the legal system, will be regulated by the FCC or the FCA or whatever, at which point then you're okay, you're kind of okay. Um, and, and as long as you can have multiple exchanges and anyone, and there's reasonable you know, fluidity about getting it out of that system, it's still kind of somewhat decentralized. So it's not the Bank of England now, yeah. sort of, you know, lots of, but it's an interesting part of the design space we'll see where it goes. And that was, these people were very, very clear for It's very scary when you see judge, senior judges, and they, you know, people writing papers with UN people, you know, mm -hmm. talking to banks from, multiple countries and regulated from multiple countries so I, I have a suspicion that they're not you know in a vacuum, thinking in a vacuum well where they talked about stuff they, they knew a lot of tech detail oh, these great. are people you know you knew what the hash functions were in some of these things yeah. judge a judge who knows a hash function <laughs> it was like yeah 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 it was like no there are, there are people like that well, I'm glad to hear it <laughs> it's, it's yeah it makes you less scared well, of course, and of course, the, the judiciary and there's another sort of decentralisation idea, if you like. In most liberal democracies, the judiciary are separate mm -hmm. from the you know, the parliament, so that's intentional. So you've got this sort of so, and balance. So when do you think that this um, new initiative in Cambridge is going to kick off? Um, uh, pretty soon. I mean, we're just going through. <laughs> so that's a funny thing. We, the university is going through due diligence on the on the donation. So uh, so it'll be great, and we'll we'll be again completely inclusive. So it'll be a place where people can just come. We're going to have one of the goals is to have a, an annual two two or three day symposium uh, where anyone can talk about interesting tech. You know, so, so our stuff here would be a, a great topic, and the experience of the governance stuff would be a, on topic. For example, uh, absolutely. Uh, but also the, 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 the technical aspects of things too, and um, uh, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm hoping to be going before the end of summer. That'd be very cool. And it's going to be embedded in the computer lamp or...? That's, that's the initial goal, yeah, yeah, that's just, we have a, the nice thing, the department has a history of doing that with, with multiple uh, organisations like that, so it's, it's, we have one of Camel Labs, it's another example, and actually it's a UK mobile one of my colleagues runs, which is also like that. So it's a sort of in, institution within the institution gotcha. thing that works okay. We have an intellectual property model, which is there isn't an intellectual property model. Uh, it's like the university doesn't own it. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that's unique. I think Cambridge is possibly the only place where that is the case. So it makes life a lot easier for this kind of thing. So, it's the open la so who is owning it? It's just the people who. People, people make up stuff, make up, yeah. the individual, the individual makes up stuff. Who if they want things. to, or most of the things we do, we just open source uh, and mm. open access documents about because uh, if we get money from government funding, we're supposed to do that, which is great. So that's an easy yeah. one. And if it's from you know, donations, then that's an easier thing because we can say they don't have any ownership of anything, yeah. everyone's getting the benefit of this. So, and that's good for them because then the charitable nature of a donation is also evident. Yeah. Well, I mean, if there's scope for us to come along and talk about the uh, the path of Matrix and obviously yeah. any excuse to go back to Cambridge and try to um, sure. spread the word. And it's crazy actually that when we began this, I guess now five years ago, people thought we were completely nuts for talking about re uh, decentralization as in people just didn't get it at all. Like WhatsApp is in the ascendant, hasn't been sold yet and you know, the coolest things is this new thing called Slack and this new thing called Telegram um, and now here we are and you've got like dedicated decentralization units springing up in universities um, being incubated. That's, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a well coincidence perhaps <laughs> we were ahead of the curve. But that's, that's yeah, yeah, I think you were. I mean, I think about when we started Databox and how this is less, this after you guys were going. Um, so yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah. Well, it's nice that the pendulum is swinging back that way. And um, in terms of the guardianship on the foundation, um, I guess we're just finding our feet after having finally announced things. I guess we legally finalized it in mid May, but then only um, obviously announced it properly a few days ago. Um, but no dramas yet so far. We've obviously got privacy um, concerns being raised by Max last night, which we were talking through in the Guardian's room and um, gone and sort of fed back there, well, hopefully on behalf of everybody. And, um, 
uh, yeah, we'll be interested to see um, where things go. And thank you, by the way, on behalf of the community and the whole Matrix project for spending some time. If you haven't got the message, John is ridiculously busy working both here and in Cambridge, as well as doing a gazillion different projects and companies. So we are you know, genuinely honored and privileged that he's had time to go and work on Matrix with us. So well, thank not you. at all. I mean, it's actually a perfect fit for the stuff I do, like we were saying. So it's not, you know, in a way, it's kind of, it's uh, not even complimentary, and it's going to be consistent and live. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all good. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, we did, um, uh, I, like, in the 90s, I was part of the Internet Architecture Board, which was oh, yeah. effectively, for six years, um, uh, was on this thing, which was the, the governance of the ITF. Right. Mm -hmm. So we would, the, the, there's a sort of, it's a bit hierarchical rather, than, but, but, but actually the way you got onto the IEST or the IAB or ISOP or whatever was, you know, was just a popular vote kind of system. So it was not, not the result of president at the top yeah. or whatever, but the, the IAB was kind of, you know, looking after how process happened a lot. So, so and people used to come and study us. We were kind of like looked at mm. like anthropologists going, oh, well, actually more like zoologists. <laughs> we were able to go to an ITF meeting, it is the zoo. It and, really is. Uh, it's, Everybody coming away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there, there all those mechanisms which were um, deployed there, I don't think they were, I don't think they were invented there. They, a lot of them come from other places, but they, they, they you know, that home thing Occupy used that. The ITF was doing it 20 years before. Mm -hmm. And it's a super interesting consensus mechanism. Yeah. It was not meant to be your know, votes. It was Rough really consensus. Very, very yeah. 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 Running code. Right. right, yeah. And it was, and um, I, my, I, my favorite, I think, when it was last ITF meeting, I was sitting in a bar and we had a meeting of a, a multi class protocol group. Doesn't matter what the details were. And it was a guy from Cisco, somebody from Juniper, and somebody who was on FreeBSD. And they all checked, they all logged into their code bases. And we were discussing you know, where the meeting had gone with this particular protocol. So they all made changes. And they all had test beds. And they all ran the tests. And they all into working. And then we had said, OK, the next the next morning in the meeting, we'll be able to say, yeah, this is all OK. We have code. We have two commercial implementations, one open source one. You can look at the open source one, and here's the new version of the document. You know, people can agree it was go to the last call or whatever, and it mm. should be okay. And that's that's a that's a really powerful process. Yeah, yeah. really cool. We're just doing a similar thing. I, I, I don't go to the meeting much anymore unless they're nearby. But there's one going on on Internet of Things protocols where I'm um, uh, working with a Spanish guy on. Uh, Profiling very small TCP implementations to fit tiny devices because you, know, you only have like a couple of K bytes to fit your entire IoT control plane and into in and uh, so that's kind of that's kind of fun and just it's kind of weird because it's revisiting stuff I worked on 30 years ago. Uh, and, TCP and just won't die anytime soon. Yeah, no, well, and taking loads of bits out, it's really yeah. funny. It's like no, no, you don't need that. You, know, it's like, <laughs> you don't need that bit. You don't need that bit. And then we had to invent a new. A new bit in the TCP header because it turned out that it was a bit of the protocol that wouldn't work efficiently in a very low power radio device unless you could do some other things. That was really, so now we, that's, that's serious, that is, to ask for a, <laughs> approval from somebody. You know, can you have that bit? Well, I'd have to think uh, who it would be to get an addendum to RFC or whatever TCP is. Mm -hmm. 791, maybe? Yeah, so something like that. Some yeah. Anyway, so, yeah. yeah. Seven nine one. Well, it won't. It yeah. won't. Be, it won't be a change in there. It'll be. It'll be because the, the the fields are in the header anyway. They're just on a side. So the oh, Ariana right. you know, internet side yeah. authority will go, assuming IABIST and everyone sign off on that. And they 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 may say no because they may say we can. It's clearly going to destroy an entire class of Cisco routers somewhere well, we're using it for some proprietary purpose. Right? Usually, what happens? This is the you know, This is why decentralization is good. Usually, what happens is. Somebody read the spec 20 years ago and has some kind of incredibly uh, naive firewall that says anything that is not defined is evil because it must be used, using it for infiltrating data or some other. Or, you know, potentially could be, but but um, so then you, you you can't change any of your protocols because there's mm -hmm. a single true internet that's waiting to work. So maybe one day we'll get spamming and um, everything on the matrix.org foundation. That was one of the questions that came up on Hacker News actually on the big 1.0 announcement with somebody saying, why is this not flatter hierarchy? Why have you got this, you know, these 12 people between like, the five guardians and the seven or eight and spec team who define the whole protocol? I mean, I'm trying to justify how obviously we've got the, the spec process thing where people can propose whatever they like and then the spec goes sign off on it. If the spec team goes rogue and 
mutton goes evil, then <clears throat> enter Professor Crowcroft to save the day and get rid of the people who are evil, etc. I mean, it, it is a bit hierarchical, but yes, I guess the answer to that is to start doing the kind of Occupy um, hand motions or the IETF humming, humming and all that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have a slightly different, I mean, it's not, it's not contradictory to that, but a different answer, which is you, you, you start in a small society and you have a direct relationship between all the people, so you have a trust relationship, even if you don't like people, you have trust in the sense you know how they're going to behave in this situation. Uh, understanding makes a better way of putting it in the general English meaning of we have an understanding. <laughs> um, and, uh, but as you as you grow the number of people who have concern, mm -hmm. you need to then involve more complicated processes. Yeah. And so, it, hence, democracies or um, consensus seeking mechanisms and so on. But, then we get into the, um, the blockchain governance stuff of um, all the different incentive mechanisms of people like Aragon and, and those guys doing proper things. So well, it's a long time until we get there. Yeah. Probably. And the audio crashed. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> um, but we're also out of time. The pub is calling, at least for you. We've got to go and talk to Cisco and oh, right. um, um, see whether we're going to be using MLS, the, you know, their new end to end encryption stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, that was why I was at ITF 101 um, to talk to those guys. So we're going to sync up with them in a, a few minutes. Um, but cool. thank you very much, John, for uh, letting us invade um, the Turing Institute and taking right. the time to have a chat. And we'll looking forward. You again. Yeah, thank you again for your time. <laughs> no, no, Oh, it's Sorry, I mean, we've all been geeking out completely and utterly on this. Oh, it's always interesting. <laughs> the, um, yeah, so there's a guy uh, in Cambridge who made a lot of money building a crypto accelerator, which he sold to Cisco. Okay. So, uh, I who he is. Um, uh, rings a bell. Like his uh, signing seat. Um, could so. be, and he might actually be an angel investor type person these days. I'll, I will dig, dig out the link. And Neil knows him. And your mind of Petty is going on with it because of a couple of stuff. So we should, you know, we should have a conversation about that sometime. Yeah, no, that'd be awesome. Uh, he's a really nice guy. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, Ron. Great. Not at all. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And um, thanks, everybody, for watching. See you soon. Bye. Bye.